Hello, good morning everybody and welcome, a very warm welcome to our workshop this morning on enhancing workforce capability and skills. It's just absolutely fantastic to be standing here in person after two years of, of Zoom where you only see half of a body, so it's, it's just great to be here. Uh, so my name's Kirstine Grant, I'm an Associate Professor of Human Resource Management, Work and Employment in the Business School at Edinburgh Napier University and it's my absolute pleasure to be chairing this workshop this morning. I have a particular interest in public service leadership and learning and development, having been a practitioner in both the NHS and the Fire and Rescue Service for about 12 years prior to becoming a full-time academic eight years ago. And it's through that interest that I became involved in the CYPER network and in particular the Education and Leadership Network. And that's how I came to be at the conference today. So we have four fantastic speakers this morning. Uh, so my objective is for me to say as little as possible, uh, to allow the speakers as much floor space as possible. And for those of you who know me, you'll recognize how much of a challenge that that might be to keep quiet, but I'm going to try. So what we're going to do is hear from the first two speakers in succession, and then we'll pause after those presentations and take some questions and some discussion, and then we'll move on to the final two speakers and leave some room for questions at the end. So it just saves us saving up all of the questions until the end of the session. So each speaker will have about 12 minutes. Um, so I'll, my main role today really is to try and keep us to time and keep things bouncing along. So just for the speakers, I might start waving my hands at you at some point just to, just to tell you to, to try to sum up and start wrapping up, if that's OK. And our first speaker this morning is Emma Williams. Um, Emma's the Director of Police Research and Strategic Partnerships at the Open University. And Emma's been researching within the police service since 2001. And most recently, and prior to joining the OU, Emma was director of the Canterbury Centre for Policing Research. So this morning, Emma's going to take us through some key findings from three research projects uh, conducted for the Uplift programme in England and Wales over the past 12 months related to the Centre for Police Research and Learning. So Emma, over to you. I have a confession to make. I'm not very good at sticking to time either, so I'm really sorry if I uh, talk really fast to get this done. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, we're very pleased um, over the last few months to have Police Scotland join our partnership, um, which has been incredibly exciting uh, because it now means that we have representation from across all four nations within our partnership. So we're very much looking forward to working more closely with um, Police Scotland um, in the future. Uh, so, um, um, I want to talk today about um, a programme of work that we have been doing for the Uplift programme, so for the Home Office. Is everyone here aware of the Uplift programme that's happening in England and Wales? Yes, I'm sure you are. I just want to make sure. Um, but it's, uh, it's been a really exciting um, programme of work. Um, it's just... Oh, oh. It's not moving. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, good we are. So it has been a really exciting um, programme of work because um, there are lots of issues um, that are coming up um, as a result of um, the Uplift programme. Some of them offer real opportunities for policing, um, but there are some fundamental challenges around the Uplift programme. Um, so we wanted to try and understand some of those things pre um, the operation coming in um, and also thinking about what we can do to try and overcome some of those challenges um, going forward. So there's a big issue around the changing profile of police officers in uh, England and Wales. There's a lot of very young um, officers joining. Uh, they're not just young in age, but they're also very young in service. And that has a quite significant um, implication for the police going forward. Um, there's also the landscape of the police education qualification framework. Um, so therefore, we want to make sure that these young recruits are coming in and being tutored well through their um, learning. So it's a bit like Catherine was talking about early, earlier, that real situated learning. How can we ensure that the learning they're getting from the university is actually being operationalised and put into practice properly? Um, so we feel that there are some kind of emerging issues that aren't yet... Um, understood properly and you've probably heard that there are some um, factors around retention and retaining these officers so we want to try and understand perhaps why um, that's happening 
Um, and also, I think there is a, another kind of national conversation and debate going on at the moment around ongoing learning for officers. So not just um, officers who are um, coming through the PEQF, but also the CPD debate going on for the current workforce, which is really important and has been discussed a lot over recent weeks with the um, College of Policing report and the foundation, um, Police Foundation review as well. Um, so all of these things we kind of wanted to understand further, um, and we were really lucky to have three pieces of research um, commissioned to us from um, the Uplift programme. Oh, see it again. Hmm. Sorry about this. Try that. There we go. So there are lots of synergies um, within the three pieces, so I want to talk a little bit about what we were trying to do, and then I'll talk through some of the findings with you. Um, but um, the three projects I want to discuss have been, um, all of them have been completed for the Uplift program, um, and I think the projects really complement each other, because we're starting to create a really important narrative about the support that new officers who are coming in um, really need to be able to... Um, kind of commit to their learning, understand what they're doing, um, and also the implications of, and opportunities that are presented by their um, younger age and their kind of different generational issues that we found. So the initial piece that we undertook was actually um, a literature review, um, and it was really to understand the implications of having um, a younger profile of officers, um, both in terms of service and age, as I said. The findings of the literature review um, that we did um, helped us to develop the, um, the second piece of work that we were asked to do, which was a, a essentially a recommendation of that first piece of work. The Uplift programme wanted us to develop an onboarding map um, which officers could use um, from the very first day of their kind of induction, if you like, which taught them through some of the realities of what they were going to get over the next few months during their probation period. So it was really about the organisation having some kind of psychological contract with those new recruits. Um, and we were really pleased to be able to do that with the Uplift team. And I'll talk about some of the findings of that um, in a minute. And the final piece, which is just completed, um, was specifically focused on the role of tutor constables. Um, the report's just being um, finalised, so hopefully it will be available soon. Um, but the process kind of involved reviewing all of our um, forces in England and Wales and understanding their approaches to um, tutor constables. So in terms of the model, the way they define the role, the support they get themselves to be able to um, help with the tutees that they are essentially looking after. Um, so we feel like we've really got a kind of whole picture now of what's going on um, around the, um, the new recruits coming in and the support that they really need um, going forward. Okay, so the first piece of work that we did was the younger work profile piece. And I think that there were three kind of key themes that emerged from our, um, our literature-based piece of work. So firstly, we recognised that there were real desires, um, you know, kind of in the younger officers that perhaps caused some co conflict with the traditional kind of police culture. Um, so the kind of idea of um, the younger generation, we found evidence that there was a real desire for much more linear leadership, um, less command and control um, styles of, of, of leadership, very, very supportive of ongoing learning. They wanted to know that they were going to have um, development through their career um, around what they, what they, so enable them really to give them the skills they needed to do their job. They had a real desire for, for learning. Um, also, um, we noticed that there was an increased kind of value, if you like, placed on academic knowledge. Um, they wanted to learn not just about that sort of tacit learning from their peers in the police, but they also had a desire to understand the evidence base around what they were doing. Um, and also the real drive to understand the contextual drivers of crime. So thinking about things like um, the way that uh, law enforcement, I can't say that now, policing interacts with um, public health, ex for example. So they had that desire to understand the contextual issues around cr criminality. Um, so process and retention also came up in our, in our review. Um, and a desire for a kind of much more transparent conversation in the process um, of their recruitment. So they wanted to be told about the reality of police work um, and also to understand the role of problem solving in their day-to-day in their -day working life. Um, and I think this relates to 
the um, finding around the contextual understanding and wanting to understand what drives crime and their kind of passion to try and help problem solve around that rather than just constantly respond um, to, the, to the kind of symptoms, if you like, of the problems. Um, and finally, we found high expectations um, from uh, our review about organisational commitments to welfare support. Um, and I think Andy Rose, you know, touched on this really well last night. Um, you know, there, there is now an understanding of, of mental health and welfare. It can be articulated much more readily than it could be a few years ago. Um, and I think that's really central to this, that those new recruits want to know that the organisation are going to support them through those sort of welfare needs. And that was something that we thought about very, very much in the development of our onboarding map. Okay, so the second piece of work was the onboarding map. Um, and um, I can't go into so much detail, unfortunately, because I know I haven't got time. Um, but we, we focused our survey that we did with um, new recruits. So we sent the survey out nationally. We had a fairly good response rate, and we also picked up a few focus groups with um, new recruits as well. But we focused our survey on four key areas, really. So questions around organisational support for them. What did they think about how the organisation was supporting them through? Uh, functionality. Um, so things about like, you know, the functioning around their access to their PQF learning, um, line management, um, and all those kinds of things. Then there were the social questions and then the cultural questions. And I'm, I haven't got time, as I say, to kind of go into much detail here, but organisationally, um, we found that recruits felt that policing was doing quite well in managing kind of really sort of instrumental type of issues. So email access, IT, all those kinds of things were fine. Um, however, there was a desire for more engagement, if you like, about having a conversation as these guys enter the police about their career aspirations. You know, what do you want to happen? Where do you see your career going? They wanted to have those conversations and felt that they weren't yet happening in their induction um, or onboarding, which is the word we're trying to use. So functionally, we found um, sort of quite strong feedback and a desire to make changes to, to tra for training um, and the relationship between their studies, if you like, that they were doing in the universities through their degree apprenticeship programme um, and the demands of pl the policing role. So really kind of being given the space to put their learning into practice, be being given the space to actually do their assessments and their, and their essays, etc. There was a real kind of need for more of that and more consideration from the organisation to support them to, to, to do that. Um, we, th there was kind of feedback in the survey through the free text comments and the focus groups that line managers could play a bigger role in supporting that um, and kind of helping to, to give them that space um, and also kind of providing some of the clarity around, you know, what to expect in their probation. Where did the learning fit with the probation and how were they going to be assessed? Was it going to be through the university or did the tutors also have a role in that? So socially, um, there were inconsistencies, I think, um, in terms of the terminology that's applied to their tutors. So all the forces um, that, well, we actually had a response from all the forces in England and Wales for the, um, for the uh, capture of the data on um, tutor constable processes. Um, but there was a real inconsistency between definitions of what the tutor was and also what the expectations of the role was. So there was an inconsistency ac across the, the different areas. So some people called them, you know, tutor, mentor, buddy. Uh, but all of the, with, with those different terms came different kind of role profiles as well. Um, so there was a clear request, I think, for um, ongoing learning support, much more help with them being able to put their learning in the, in the university, the theoretical understanding, that sort of codified knowledge into practice. And that would really be through um, the tutor constables that they are assigned to. Um, and finally, culturally, um, we found that new recruits kind of wanted to, be, to better understand the reality of policing before starting. Um, they wanted more information about what it looked like, more information about their partnerships, working with other agencies. Um, and also, I think, you know, that talks to, if you like, that desire to understand the bigger picture. They want to know where their work fits in um, with the kind of drivers of crime and how they can help to get involved in that. I'll speed up a bit, sorry. Um, okay, so the final work, piece of work was the work with tutor constables. And I think if, if we've learned anything um, from this piece of work, um, it's very much that um, the, um, 
the tutor constables are absolutely central uh, to this. They really are totally central to building uh, the capabilities of these new recruits. We've got so many officers coming in, so many that we can't actually recruit them. We haven't got enough applying to become police officers. So the capacity issue is something, but actually building capability is what is fundamental. That is the most important part. If you put new police officers in roles that they haven't got the skills and the equip they are not equipped with the skills to make them capable to do it, we're finding in, a, in another piece of research we're doing in uh, CPRL at the moment that it's really affecting their welfare, really affecting their well-being and their own professional identity. So actually this building of cap capability at this point is absolutely crucial. So, um, so thinking about kind of, um, you know, bo both the projects that I've talked about previously has made us realise just how important the tutors are in socialising new officers. Um, through the review that we've done, um, we've realised that, you know, there are a, a, a range of different models across the country, in, in, well, in, in England and Wales. Um, but actually, um, what we're finding is that it's more important to have the role right, to get the role right rather than a model. You know, it doesn't really matter what model you use. It's contextual and it will be dependent on your own setup and your own structures within, um, within your organisation. Um, but actually, you know, it's the, it's the relationship with the, the tutor, the, the recruit, the relationship the, that the universities have with their, um, with their police um, partner. Um, and also it's about giving the tutors themselves the skills that they need to support the tutors through. It isn't something that comes naturally to everybody. And if they're trying to drive forward support through the, the new recruits' curriculum, they also must understand some of that curriculum. And if we don't support those officers, we're not giving them the skills they need to be able to make the new recruits capable within their role and confident in their role as well. Um, so I think what we really concluded was that the, the tutor delivery model itself may not be the most important factor in the effectiveness of a tutoring programme. Uplift wanted us to come up with a what works, what's the best model. It's not like that. It's much more important and, and, and worthy, if you like, if you give those tutor constables the skills and you recognise the qualities in those individuals that are taking on those roles. We're seeing, as happens a lot in policing, that officers are being voluntold that they've got to go and do this role. But actually, it might not suit all people. They, and if you don't then give them the skills they have got to have to, to be able to do it, it, it simply is unfair. It's unfair, and organisational justice comes into play here, really does. Um, this links closely, I think, to the tutor recruitment process and the need to explore, as I've said, capability as well as capacity. Um, and I think we, we as a team firmly believe that you know, the, the perceived lack of support and the perceived lack of development, um, if, you, if we don't give those officers that, those skills, we will have a further problem with retention. You know, and we're, we're seeing already that there is disparity in, uh, in areas around retention issues. We don't know why, we don't know why. But I would probably put money on the fact that it's to do with the support they're getting and their ability to put this new learning into practice, which is a huge wasted opportunity. Um, so, um, just very quickly, um, what's next? Um, so, the onboarding uh, map that we've developed uh, for Uplift is now with the team and it's going to be piloted um, and evaluated, I believe. Um, so, that will be interesting to see what new recruits think of that. Um, there's been a retention lead um, put in place in Uplift now. Hopefully, that will enable capturing you know, good data to start to understand what exactly is going on here. Um, and also, I think there's a need to understand issues around diversity as well within that space. So, you know, who's leaving? Why are they leaving? What's the demographic of those people that are leaving? And actually, how can we map that onto the, the tutors that they've got as well? Really, really important piece of work to be done there. Um, and thirdly, um, a piece of work that we're doing um, at CPRL um, is a second stage of the tutor constable work. We're really lucky in that our membership, um, who are you know, 24 forces, um, agreed to kind of let us use some of the membership money to do that research. Um, and that will be a much more kind of deep, um, deep dive, if you like, into five force areas who have all got different models that we identified from that first piece. Um, but we really want to capture the voice now of the tutor constables themselves. Um, so do some in-depth work, et cetera, et cetera, with them. So I'll stop there. But if anyone has got any questions later, that's fine. And anything I can do to talk further to any of you, I would. <laughs> okay, thank you.
Thank you very much, Emma. That was fascinating. So what we're going to do now is move straight on to our second speaker, after which we'll pause for some questions and some discussion before we then move on to the final two speakers. So our spe second speaker is also from the Open University, and this time it's Jennifer Norman. So Jennifer's head of the Department for Policing Organisation and Practice at the OU, and prior to that, she was programme director for a policing degree programme designed specifically for serving police officers and staff at Canterbury Christchurch University. So in her talk this morning, um, Jennifer's talk centres around preliminary findings from a longitudinal and mixed methods study contributing to the current debate around policing education and professionalising the police in England and Wales. So Jennifer's findings are drawn from interviews and surveys with students enrolled in a part-time policing degree whilst also working full-time as a police officer or police staff. So Jennifer. Make sure I don't trip over anything either. <laughs> That's what I generally do. Just choose the right thing. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, um, Kirsten, and thank you for having me today. Um, as um, Kirsten's mentioned, I'm here to talk to you about um, my PhD research, which focuses on the role of um, degree level education in policing. I'm <clears throat> I've been doing it for about 500 years, this PhD, and I'm pleased to say I'm nearing the end. I've, I've done my analysis and I'm in the, in the final write-up stages of the work. But my story of my participants isn't quite complete, so I don't feel I can tell you the full story yet. But the research is longitudinal in its design, um, and I've um, conducted fieldwork over five years across three cohorts of students. So today I just wanted to briefly take this opportunity to tell you about some of the learning from my first cohort of students, from listening to their experiences of um, studying a degree and also bringing that learning or not into their role at work. Now, I probably don't need to do this because you're probably all au fait with um, the background of, um, of the professionalisation um, in England and Wales of the police, but it's kind of customary to do that. So I'll just briefly whiz through this slide um, before I go on to explain what I've done and some of the findings. So following the NAROID review in 2011, um, Theresa May, the then Home Secretary, announced her intention for a professional body, um, a professional police body, which w became the, the College of Policing. Its function would be to develop a body of knowledge, um, set professional standards, standards of conduct, ethical values, skills leadership, and, and the like. Um, so the College's remit was to set... Um, particularly around the role of education and, and degree qualifications, was to set those um, edu educational requirements to ensure that there was consistency um, across the, the, um, the country around um, training and education. Um, just to try and place now my research in the context of that reform. My research is slightly different because my participants aren't doing the PEQF degree programme. They, they have done a BSc in policing programme. But it is kind of important to sort of set the reform agenda and when I started my field work. So when the College of Policing was set up in 2012, their first kind of big piece of work was to set the code of ethics um, and they published those codes of ethics in 2014. Um, they then went on and did a leadership review in 2015. Um, because we know from the literature um, um, around professionalisation, often the educational requirement is then the, the next piece that's um, required. So I started then my field work after that leadership review in 2016, thinking at any point the college is going is to uh, announce something around the, the need for education in police training in whatever way, shape or form it was. We didn't know when it was going to be announced. 
um, thought it was going to be imminent, but didn't know what it was going to look like either. Um, so I had started my fieldwork at, at, that, at that point. Three months later, at the end of 2016, the college then made their announcement around the intentions of the police education qualification framework, and that mandated um, the, the idea that all new recruits coming into policing would need a degree level qualification. This was met with controversy, um, particularly from serving officers around the need for the degree, uh, a degree qualification. Um, um, and and, and um, understandably, there were office, officers who posed um, questions around not having a degree and therefore did that make them unprofessional. So it was a really tri tricky space. It was landed in a, in a difficult way, the message. Six years on, the debate carries on around the role of, of um, degree level um, education in policing. And I think this is further compounded at the moment with um, the, 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 um, de the degree apprentices that uh, apprenticeship programs, as Emma was talking about, are pr uh, the PQF is aligned to those new recruits coming in rather than upskilling and investing in serving officers. And I think that creates another tension. So knowing this kind of narrative is important because it demonstrates the complexities around integrating education into, a, into a, an established profession anyway, but it also highlights the cultural um, resistance um, at the time when I started my, um, my research, it also posed questions to me. I'd just done my literature review. I'd actually done a, 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 a small-scale study um, with officers who'd done a degree with Emma um, and had this kind of sense that what, what, what research has actually, what evidence base has gone into the idea of, of integrating qualifications as, as, uh, um, within policing. So this then became the focus of, um, of my work. Very briefly then, the, the rationale and the aims and objectives of, of my PhD is to really try and understand what knowledge uh, and skills or how the knowledge and skills gained from police students undertaking a degree, how they can really utilise that in police organisations in the short term and in the long term. What are those benefits? I felt that that really wasn't really that understood um, there was no evidence base, obviously, in, in England and Wales. There is evidence base elsewhere, but it's quite inconsistent depending on where, what country you're looking at. So I designed um, a methodology so I could track people over time, track students over time. Um, so it was a five-year piece. Uh, Fieldwork went from 2016, as I mentioned, through to last year. I had three cohorts of students. Um, and I had a phased approach to the methodology at four different time points. So I, I surveyed students whilst they were studying their degree, twice at the beginning at the end of their degree. I then um, conducted semi-structured interviews with them once they had graduated and then a year later. So I took a sample of, of the, co the cohorts and did in-depth um, interviews with them twice um, at, at the third and fourth t time points. I could really get a sense of how um, their experiences of their degree as they were studying and then what happened after, what, what knowledge could be transferred into practice. Um, in total, I did um, 120 surveys and 62 um, interviews. So lots of stuff on the slide to worry about that. Um, but just to give you a quick sense of, um, of the participants, just so it's completely clear, um, they were all police officers or members of police staff working full time. They worked in a variety of police forces in, in, England, in England and Wales um, and a national uh, police force as well. They were all enrolled on a, on a part time basis. Um, on um, the same degree, a BSc honours in policing at the same university. Um, most had paid for their tuition fees themselves, um, and they started their degree in 2000. This particular cohort, my first cohort, started their degree in 2014, so pre that announcement from the college. 
They'd finished it post the, the initial announcement of, from the college and graduated in 2018. So that gives you a bit of a sense of my participants. They were mainly male. They were aged um, between 24 um, and 44. They were white in the main. Um, they had a fair amount of experience. Most of them had between five and 15 years experience. So they, just to give you a general sense of um, their place in the organisation and, and um, who, they, who they were. So, um, what did I find? Um, I was really interested um, through the surveys and the interviews to understand what motivated them originally to do the degree. Um, most of them, in fact all of them, have, uh, have said to me um, they wanted a degree level qualification. That was really, excuse me, I've got to cough. <coughs> That was really important to them. Many of them had left um, academia or their school, college to join, join the job, um, as was much more of a thing, um, uh, you know, back in the day before we are now. Um, so um, they were really keen to get um, to get that degree level qualification. Other motivating factors for them to do the degree were around them bolstering their own professional development. Um, they were really keen and, and reflected upon in the interviews um, the ability for them to um, use theories and specialised knowledge of their own, their own um, um, specialised knowledge and be able to apply that in their own practice. Um, and they thought that that was a really useful thing to bolster their um, promotional um, prospects. There was also a, 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 a small amount of officers who were motivated to do the degree to future-proof themselves um, as an exit ticket out because they were looking at alternative degrees, um, careers, apologies. So, um, yes, there's some quotes on the slide, so please just read them at your leisure. I then wanted to know about what they felt, what they perceived the benefits were of undertaking the degree. Um, and they all found that they'd obviously developed skills, um, particularly critical thinking skills, reflective practice skills, um, and the ability to use in-depth theoretical knowledge. Um, they felt that all of those things enabled and equipped them to, um, to impact on their own decision-making in their own uh, role in an analytical and applied way um, and they felt um, uh, really positive about that. Um, I think the other thing is they felt more equipped and confident when they were having conversations with other professionals, um, other external partners as a result of having that degree level qualification. So I'd say all of the benefits that they explained to me were really quite meaningful in a, in a transformational way for them as individuals. Those benefits, um, kind of the achievement of the degree was one thing, but the other benefits um, increased their own sense of, of professionalism in their role. So they really did place a real high value around um, attaining their degrees. Again, there's lots of info on the slide. There are two quotes, so just, again, just feel free to just read through those at your leisure. Um, so I then wanted to find out how they'd used their skills and knowledge um, from their degree. Um, and I don't think the findings are particularly surprising, but they are interested, trust, interesting in, in um, consideration of the reform and the timeline um, around the PEQF. So the interviews took place in 2018 and 2019 after they'd graduated and then a year later. So at this stage, the college was committed to the PEQF. <coughs> and at this stage, um, you know, policing was going to become a graduate profession if you want to term it in those ways. So you would think investment in learning is something that should, should have sort of started, certainly with this, the officers um, in, in force at the time. However, um, the value that um, was placed on learning was, was within the different organisations and forces was inconsistent. Value was um, sort of 
I've understood value in two ways. The practical support, um, so that's where tuition fees may have been supported or, or time off for study may have been supported. Where, where officers were, who were few, two out of, my, out of this sample um, had their fees um, paid for, they felt really valued as a result, but most, most didn't. And across the board of, of all of my participants, most weren't um, funded to do their course. Um, they, all, they all funded it themselves. And that, that second um, practical support was around time, time off for study. Now, um, again, there were, there were um, inconsistencies across forces there, with some forces having no force policy to support um, study leave. So some students were going along to their lectures, having to take annual leave um, and, and um, do their assessments again in their own time. So there was no sort of um, force, force policy to support those alongside their peers who might have been in a force who had, did have a study leave policy. So there's a kind of tension and an inconsistency there. So that was one sense of kind of value in a practical sense. Um, however, I, I think the more, more kind of detrimental and, and something that led to more frustrations were the, the graduates um, in the main were just unable to use their knowledge in their role. They weren't encouraged to by their line management nor the wider um, organisation. Um, and I think being, being able to transfer knowledge into the workplace was considered um, to be a sign of value, um, but it was... It, it was dependent on the influence an officer already had in the organisation. So, for example, despite being motivated to use their skills and knowledge from their degree, those who held less senior ranks, including constables and members of police staff, had less opportunity to support and integrate their learning into their practice, and that made them feel quite devalued, considering they paid and invested their time in, in studying a policing-related degree qualification. And, and I suppose, conversely, those who did hold rank, um, um, and I'd say this was evident from the inspectors and chief inspectors that I spoke to, they had opportunities to bring their knowledge into their work. Um, they had autonomy, they had the influence, and they had... Um, they were inspired by their reading, inspired by the theories that they had, had um, researched and understood through the degree and were really innovative around applying them into different programmes of work that they could introduce. So they had that influence to be able to do that. And, and when they did that, they had a huge sense of value um, around that. So it's important to kind of start to unpick, um, unpick some of these things. Um, I'm aware of time. I've got one more slide. Um, so valuing knowledge, um, certainly in cohort one, and, and um, I've found this throughout, is a really important thing. Having the um, ability within organisations um, to utilise the skills and learning from those who are investing in their own continued professional development is really important. The benefits are, com are multifaceted on on, a, on an individual level, but also for the organisation as well. Um, Emma and a colleague, Tom, um, talked about um, how knowledge is hierarchical, and I think what I've certainly um, found in, in this, in this um, research is exactly, exactly the same. And here the participants' experiences demonstrate the importance of mainstreaming um, the ability to infiltrate knowledge from, from um, these courses. Um, at all levels, regardless of rank. It would maximise the skills and talents within the organisation. It would enhance problem solving um, and decision making at, at, at all levels. And also, importantly, value the people. The findings speak to the organisational justice literature that Andy Rhodes was talking about last night. Those who feel more supported and, and valued in the workplace will demonstrate more of a commitment to the vision of the organisation. And this is really important when we're thinking about the PEQF reform and how these people, what these people are telling me. The findings from this first cohort of study suggest that the majority felt devalued in their ability to um, utilise the learning in practice. And this made them sceptical. <coughs> Of the, of the PEQF. They felt it was lip, lip service and meaningless. 
I know you're, look, you're looking at me, aren't you? <laughs> um, but I just, I mean, just to end on that point, really, I think if, if, if the reform is something um, that, that the, the organisation needs to buy into, then people need to be listened to. Opportunities need to be made for officers to support them on a practical level but, and also make that learning meaningful um, in practice by finding mechanisms in and empowerment of officers so they can use that knowledge in their role. So I'll end it, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. So I'm quite keen to just pause for five or ten minutes at this point um, and just open up to the floor for questions. If there's anything that you would like to ask either Emma or Jennifer at this point before we move on to our final two speakers. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's 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 really quite frightening, actually. Um, some of the things that we've we've seen in in some of the research that we've been doing, um, and I'm we're finding it particularly within detective roles, actually, um, with um, new officers coming in as direct detectives in some in some forces, and then they're going into areas where they're investigating really really complex crime um, without the mentor because there's not the experience there anymore or with the, um, the learning that they need themselves. So I do think you're right, it is a huge challenge. Um, I don't think at the moment there is enough value placed on CPD in policing at all. I, I feel really, and I know Andy feels the same, Jenny feels the same. Um, I think the PQF has focused very, very much on new recruits at the detriment of the professionalism of the current workforce. Um, and I think that's been reflected in retention figures. Um, and I think, you know, that's the only way that we're going to be able to do this because the profile is not going to change, is getting younger. And Andy said that last night, it's not going to change. So the only way that we're going to be able to try and do something practically is to ensure that those people have got the skills they need. Um, and, and it's a bit of a vicious circle, isn't it? Because if they're not supported when they come in, then they won't be able to provide the support. But also mentoring and tutoring and enabling learning into practice is, is <coughs> a skill. It's a really, really difficult thing to do. Um, and I think if you don't give them, some universities, for example, are now offering tutor constables some kind of mentoring course and the forces are buying into delivering that, but it isn't consistent. And I don't think some of the courses are perhaps as good as they should be, um, but you, that's the only way, and you're, you're absolutely right, and I'd be very happy to speak to you further about what we're finding, because there's loads more than I've talked about today, um, because we're doing a project on rape investigation as well, and this is one of the key issues, hugely, mm. really is. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think I'd um, echo what Emma said about the expectation, or, or the implications of um, the PEQF um, sort of having um, a stake in the ground to support officers um, and that just hasn't in, in continued professional development and, and not forgetting police staff as well um, that just hasn't come to fruition at the, at, you know at the moment and I think as the younger officers come into play the expectation you, you mentioned from the research is that they do want that continued uh, investment in their own learning um, but we need to listen to how the learning is being integrated at the moment, understand those messages so we can kind of um, find a way of, of making that happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, to mirror what you said, yeah, I, I think it's a, it is 
quite tricky. I think, what, what, I mean, we could probably talk about this all day, but one of the things that I find really frustrating, and this is me being really candid, mm -hmm. is that the College of Policing are a functioning body that are meant to use an evidence base around what they do, and yet they haven't learned from the research that's been done over the years about knowledge into practice, about you know how you do that in a, in a really difficult, sometimes policing culture that's moving really fast. They haven't actually listened to that and used it in the application of the PQF, which is strange. <laughs> okay, I wonder, we've maybe got time for one more question. In a short way, no, and no. <laughs> um, the College of Policing had a bursary, didn't they? But it was obviously quite limited in terms of how many people would access it. Yeah, I, I think there was a real dis disappointment with... Um, and, and it is interesting, actually, because I've obviously followed the three cohorts now, and my field work, work is complete. And, you know, there, there are nuggets of gold where actually people are supported. Um, and that's fabulous when that happens, when they can, when they can do, you know, all of that, the, the, the innovation and bring that learning in. Um, but generally, no. And generally, now this was, this was always curious to me, um, they had this huge sense of value over them uh, achieving a degree. But when I asked them about what do you think about the PEQF and the requirement for a degree for new entrants, they literally, all of them, a small percentage didn't, but all of them said no, is it shouldn't be the case. And that was curious to me. I'm still just working that out. I think I'm there, but maybe next time I'll be able to talk about that. But no, and no, unfortunately, I think, to answer your question. Okay. So I'd like to just move us on at that point to our third speaker at the moment, and hopefully maybe at the end we'll have time to come back, because I know there were a couple of other questions for, for Emma and Jennifer as well. So our third speaker is Andy Lancaster, and Andy heads learning at the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, where he's responsible for the vision and creation of innovative learning solutions to support the people profession worldwide. So the COVID-19 pandemic has forced learning practitioners to really reflect on their practice and consider opportunities to accelerate change and drive innovation. So Andy's going to use evidence from the 2021 <coughs> CIPD Learning and Skills at Work report, and he'll highlight five key shifts in the way organisations are now designing and delivering workplace learning as we begin to emerge and recover from the pandemic. Thank you, that's great. <clears throat> Good to be with you. Um, my role looks across sectors, so I'm closely involved with policing. I'm on the um, L&D Workforce Transformation Group uh, in England, so uh, that's a passion for me. But I guess what I'm going to show you in the next 10 minutes, and it will be 10 minutes, is what we're seeing now emerging across sectors, whether it be retail, manufacturing, police, public sector, private sector. So these are trends from a research study that we've, uh, we've been doing. Um, great to be back in Scotland. Um, one of my claims to fame is um, I've spent time in prison in Scotland. Um, I was head of learning for one of the rehab charities, so I spent many an hour in Edinburgh Prison and Barlinny and many others. So it's, um, it's quite something for me to come back again uh, and spend some time here. So thanks for the invite to be here today. Okay, um, slightly rhetorical question, but if I asked you, um, and incidentally, I'm going to give you five reflective questions which you can take away from this, this presentation. Uh, we may have time. You might want to pick up on some of those when we do um, a Q&A. If I ask you what's the most significant change that's impacted staff development in your context in the last year during COVID, it's very interesting when we ask this question across sectors. Um, you obviously get things like remote working. Obviously, within policing, it's a very different thing. But what you'll see through this presentation is there have been some significant shifts uh, which have a huge impact on how we design learning. So again, passionate about universities, passionate about graduate um, development, all these kind of things. But we need to recognise the world has changed massively in the last 18 months, and this has an impact on how uh, we will deliver learning. 
So my first degree was in design. Um, I, I graduated from Brunel and lectured at Brunel um, as a designer, a, a product designer. And it's interesting, if you look at what creates innovation, often it's something like a crisis, which is a key for innovation. We are generally, most of us, and I'll look at the ceiling there so I don't catch anybody's eye right now, we are generally quite lazy on innovation when things are not changing around us. And the difference between a soft pencil and a diamond, which have essentially the same chemical compound, is that a diamond has experienced immense pressure and heat deep in the earth, which transforms it from a pretty soft, pretty uh, invaluable thing, or value, not, not huge value, to a diamond here. So what we're um, seeing at the in Institute is that um, this pandemic has actually forced for good some of the innovation around learning. Uh, there's not many good things that have come out of the pandemic. For me, the transformation of digital learning has been one of those which we have been waiting for many, many years. Many of us have been around this. I go back to the laser disc in the 1980s. That's how old I am. And we've been sitting waiting for this to happen. And actually, the pandemic has forced the hand now. And many senior leaders now finally have woken up to the fact that actually doing something digitally is not inferior to face-to-face, -face providing you design it well. So this kind of... COVID thing has been quite interesting for us. And I think there is an existential issue for us in learning. Um, we have a transformational opportunity, but also many of us have worked in institutions which have had a very fixed way of doing things. We send people to college. We send people to university. In a sense, there's nothing wrong with that. But what we're now seeing is there's an existential challenge. And I want to pick up a little bit around some of the thinking around apprenticeships. And really interesting, both of you mentioned we struggle sometimes to get knowledge transfer into the workplace because we don't have the structures in place to make that happen. So I think it's a really important one for us now, whatever our role in learning, to recognize the pandemic has actually done something quite fun fundamental for us. So this is a piece of um, research we've done. Um, you can get it free of charge. There's the, if you just Google CIP learning and skills at work. And this, this piece of um, research work was done as we emerged from, well, we are emerging from the pandemic, although I think we've got a monkey pandemic now brewing as well, so maybe there's another one coming. But this was emerging after um, most, most organisations were beginning to get their post-pandemic plans. And just to say it was a fairly significant piece of research, 1,200 respondents. And the important thing here is, and this is what I want to stress to you, it was across sectors. So this is government, this is charity, Charity, this is private sector. And what was interesting for us is, as well as having um, senior managers in the mix, um, so this was not just L&D professionals, uh, we had managers in the mix as well. So a really, really interesting sample where we were asking them, how do you think learning is changing? And what was interesting for us was um, only about 18% think that they're going to go back to how they did it prior to the pandemic. And this was backed up by some of Fosway's research as well, who came up with about a 20% figure as well. So why is there a picture of a loaf of bread on there? Our view in, uh, as an institute now is that this change is largely baked into stay now. Uh, those who want to gravitate back to how it was, in my view, provocatively, I'll say they've got a vested interest in doing it how they did before. They're not necessarily thinking about what their learners need. They have their own view um, that the, the old way of doing it, and I, I was with someone recently who said, I'm just looking forward to going back to how it was before. In my view, that's changed, and I think we've got to grasp the changes here. So very quickly, five things that we've picked up which are definitely changing across sectors. The first, or oh, the digital, holistic, the thing about learning cultures, ownership, and skills. So very quickly, just going through those. First one is digital. What we found was there was an obvious rush to digital. People needed to get online very quickly, and um, many organizations were struggling um, with infrastructure and Zoom and all these kind of things. But what we found was that the actual digital experience is pretty low, to be honest with you. Um, I can now go to Ikea. I don't know you guys go to Ikea at all. I can go to Ikea now and use artificial um, reality now to drop, as I did recently, to drop a chest of drawers into my room to see what it looks like. That's the technology that our learners are using on a daily basis. But we somehow think it's acceptable to give them a crappy LMS and a bit of content. So what we need to recognize now that the experience for many of our learners, the technology experience has been pretty low. And what we found is, you, you necessarily better read all of this, but what we found is there was a huge move towards virtual classrooms, which is absolutely understandable in learning management systems. But I want to highlight you the third one on there, which is really interesting which I haven't got time to go into today, but socialised learning and gathering people in communities of practice is one of the fundamental ways that people are now using technology to connect, more so than even things like podcasts and videos. So what we're seeing is there is a real shift around how people are using technologies. And what we found is that we call them basic um, content pushers and sophisticated learners, uh, uh, um, technology users. 
the basic users were simply putting a bit of content out there and running the odd Zoom session, right the way through to those who are now using sophisticated technology. And it warms my heart. We did some work with one of the police forces. I went in to talk about digital stuff, and it was like really quite folded arms on this one. And we then found, when we went back three months later, they got drones up, and they were videoing police pursuits uh, in order to show how this happens. The initial reaction was, we are police drivers. We don't do those kind of things. We sit in a car. But it's fascinating to see how they use drones then to augment how they were delivering their learning. Now, what we found is those who were more sophisticated, this is a crucial slide coming up here, so if nothing else, grab this next one here. Those ones who were sophisticated found their learners asked for more technology and their senior leaders asked for more technology. So when people say to me, oh, our learners don't really want technology, probably the answer is it's pretty meagre what's being offered to them, so they don't know what they could have. So what we're finding is where people are becoming more sophisticated in their use of technology, they are asking for more. And their leaders are saying, we love the way that this is working for us now. Can we leverage more? So that's a really, really crucial slide for us. So I guess quickly the reflection on this one is what's our ambition to use technology to support learning. We've got to get beyond simple virtual classes and content dumps to thinking about the, the, the technology which is available in order to train uh, and, and develop police officers. Second one is holistic responses. What we found is there's been a significant shift that the formal course is not now the only or the primary way that we do things. Many organisations now are not recognising formal courses as their primary way of doing development. doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing degree programmes, we shouldn't be doing formal courses, but there's a lot being wrapped around in organisations now which is being valued. So on this slide here, and um, apprenticeships are on there, guys, which is really cool. But if you look at, and these trends are 2020, just prior to the, the um, pandemic, and 2021, the shape is pretty similar. What you're now finding is developing people in the flow of work now is the biggest priority for most organisations. They want to get that support which you talked about for that police officer in the moment sometimes in order to have that. You see coaching and mentoring is in there. Interestingly, sending people to instructor-led training off the job is now a lesser option for many organisations. And what we see here is um, organisations which don't even have an L&D function, they don't even have a learning team, now are doing incredibly well on delivering learning in the flow of work. So you don't have to have a great learning team to do this. We're now seeing that these kind of shifts, apprenticeships, those kind of things are really important. So just on this one, I think we've got to think about how we more creatively leverage content collaboration and community. It's not just about bumping people onto courses. Number three, a little bit on culture. We need to really think about involving our learners and our managers and our supervisors and uh, you know, our police mentors in the learning process more and more. What we found is, again, if we look at the technologies, we found those who are more sophisticated in the use of technologies are doing knowledge sharing, problem solving, self-directed learning. So again, there's this kind of bump effect again, that if you are using good technologies, if you're actually enabling people to use smart devices, what you're finding is that the learning culture is becoming far more self uh, you know, self-directed in terms of how people are learning, which I think is a really positive thing. And managers, you can substitute managers for whatever term you want to here, but what we found is that organisations that are doing really well really embed managers and supervisors in the learning process. It's not an optional extra. These are the people who actually support and help practice to be developed. We absolutely, if we ignore these supervisors in our plans for delivering learning, we will absolutely miss it. So I can't stress enough, whenever we go, when I go to conferences and say, um, who's in your learning team? No one ever puts their hand up and says, my supervisors or my managers. They always say, I've got a learning technologist or I've got a learning manager. Guys, the, the reality is the supervisor is, is the kingpin in making this kind of learning work. And again, we're seeing even people who are delivering in the line of business now are recognising that. So just on this one, I think we've got to think about involving learners and staff in the process of designing learning and delivering learning. They know often how they want to have that. So nearly there, number four, um, just about there, um, ownership. We're seeing a trend to allow learners to have some empowerment of their learning journey. Clearly, you've got to have some specific topics that you cover, but what we're seeing a trend to empower people in their learning journeys. And again, we see all sorts of things going on where learners are supporting each other, they're encouraging to share with each other, that kind of practice sharing. It's really important that we enable learners to connect together beyond uh, the formal course. So there's a thing here around how can we, in very fixed curricula, how can we help learners to connect and share their practice? Uh, that's really important for us. And lastly, just on skills. Um, learning in the moment of need in the flow of work is really important. Um, 
haven't done a PhD, but the book is still selling well three years on in the Amazon charts. Um, we got asked so often, how do we move learning into the flow of work, which is why we did the book um, around this. So there is this real sense of we've got to get learning in the moment of need. And what we're seeing on skills is, I want to just point at this graph really quite shockingly, is um, nearly 50% of organizations have no idea what their future skills uh, profile is going to be. They just do not know how technology is going to change it. That's a real shocker. So we've got to help organizations to understand about future skilling. And this one was the really scary one for me. 12% of the organizations who responded said, we don't even know what our skills needs are. That's really, really scary. So we've got to think about what our skills profile is. Just to say, kind of just in closing, What's really interesting here, where we see leaders really valuing learning, normally the learning teams have really worked out what skills. It sounds so basically obvious, but where learning teams can't define future skills, then senior managers tend not to value the learning provision. So we've got to think about learning in the flow of uh, work, learning in the moment uh, now. So just to kind of finish off, um, not all the things out of the report, you can grab the report for yourself, it's free for you. But these are five things that we see the pandemic has really shifted in terms of digital, holistic culture, learners owning learning, and skills development. So um, thank you. I hope the report's useful for you. We are just working on the next one. Um, so we're really tracking what's happening with the pandemic. But um, this is a great time to be in learning. It's time to shake it up, guys. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, I think it's fascinating that the types of technological experiences and interactions that people are having outside of work are really influencing and shaping the demand and expectations inside the workplace. And I think that will be fascinating over the next few years to see how that develops. So moving us on to our final speaker before we um, open up the floor again to some questions. So our final speaker today is Julie Berg. So Julie is a senior lecturer in criminology at the School of Social and Political Sciences. And she's also Associate Director of the Scottish Centre for Crime and Justice Research, thank goodness I got that right, at the University of Glasgow. Um, so prior to joining the University of Glasgow back in 2018, Julie worked at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And today she's going to talk about a collaborative project with Professor Clifford Shearing. Um, and um, Julie's going to discuss some of the contemporary and future challenges facing policing organisations related specifically to the changing nature of global harms and harmscapes. Um, and she'll reflect on some of the implications of that for development and capabilities and skills of, the, of police practitioners. So thank you, Julie. So thank you everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here and thank you to Cypher for organising this conference. So I feel a bit of a prior in this panel because I'm going to look at a, re a really bigger picture, a global perspective. And I'm going to be doing this presentation. Uh, Clifford Turing couldn't join us today but he is join joining us online so I do hope that I do justice to this presentation. And so what I'd like to talk about is, is the policing of new homescapes and really reflecting on the challenges facing policing going forward in the 21st century, I want to reflect on two models of policing, just so that I can show, well, what does that mean for the types of police forces that we're looking at and the skills and development capacities and capabilities that they need in light of these new homescapes? So firstly, we all know this, but I wanted to reflect, but what are the new homescapes? And Clifford and I have called these homescapes, I mean, they harm landscapes, we just put them together and call them homescapes. And they're two big homescapes that we are confronting. And they are very important because they have a global reach and they have a profound impact on policing, safety, security, uh, and you know, all populations, all communities. And the first, of course, is called the Anthropocene uh, to recognize the role that we as humans have had on shaping this new earth. And obviously, the, the most widely recognized component of Anthropocene are the effects of climate change. The Earth has been heating up, and this heating is bringing about climatic shifts. Think about wildfires, droughts, heat waves, cyclones, flooding, and so forth. And one of the terms that have been used to recognize this new normal or this new Earth is obviously um, the age of the Anthropocene, but also the age of catastrophe. And we're in kind of a shock the shock of the Anthropocene in terms of the scale of these harms that we're confronting. 
The second global development is what James Lovelock has termed the Nova scene, Nova meaning new. Uh, but it's also referred to sometimes as the metaverse or the digiverse. And a cru crucial feature of this Nova scene or digiverse is the emergence or rise of new intelligences, ar artificial intelligence in other words. And so these new cyberspaces like the Anthropocene also uh, bring about with them new harmscapes uh, that policing entities have to confront. So if that wasn't enough, of course there are other challenges that policing organisations face in any way, and I've only put down a few here, um, you know, in terms of not only dealing with the new harmscapes, but also increasingly diverse communities with complex needs, trying to police these communities, trying to gauge what they need or want, the tensions between local needs versus central objectives, um, the, the tensions too between trying to specialise as a policing organisation, but also being required to generalise, so specialist, generalist, tensions, of course the ongoing quest for performance, to be more efficient, to be doing more for less, to be legitimate, to have confidence from the public, um, also the difficulties of engaging in plural formations, engaging with other organisations, coordination issues, uh, challenges of, of coordinating with others, challenges of, of partnering with others in terms of trust issues, information sharing, communication, power issues as well as the fact that the old harmscapes didn't go away. So we have new harmscapes and we have the old harmscapes that policing organisations are still confronting or faced with. So what I'm going to do next is, is reflect on two international models of policing. Again, just so that we can think about, well, what are the implications? If we're engaging with these new harmscapes, what does that mean in terms of cap capabilities and skills of the police going forward? And so the first one is, is quite a well-established one. It's called nodal policing. Um, and in this form of policing, the public police deliberately position themselves as one node among many others in webs of policing. So this is done to enable policing to mobilise and integrate a broad set of knowledges and capacities in promoting safety and security. So the idea here has been to extend this idea of whole of government policing arrangements actually to include whole systems or what we've called whole of society policing. So essential to this form of policing is the idea that effective policing requires the inclusion of a wide range of capacities and knowledges to deal with the problem. Um, and in this particular orientation, the police do that. They coordinate, they harness the capacity of others and this is sometimes called problem-orientated policing or guardianship policing. But essentially from the images here, on the, the one on the left, that is an example of neighbourhood safety officer in Cape Town where they have special training to undertake this. So they don't actually do the policing, although they can. They get others in the community who know it better than they do to solve those problems. And the equivalent of that is the Buurt Regisseur, I hope I said that okay, in Amsterdam, which is a neighbourhood coordinator both fulfilling the same type of role. So this was a joint project between Cape Town and Amsterdam to try to reimagine what could the police do to harness a local level whole of society engagement with some of these, these big problems. And the second model is what has been called, or what we've called resilience policing. And with resilience policing, the focus of policing is, is enhancing the ability of social units, for example, communities, to respond to and recover from disasters. So resilience in this regard is policing have the, the responsibility, the duty, to make others more resilient. And these disasters are related to the Anthropocene and the Novocene. For example, from climatic disasters, flooding, droughts, fires, as well as cyber attacks. So the focus of resilience policing is not simply to utilize multiple sources, like in the nodal model, of capacity and knowledge, but to proactively build these resources to enhance resilience so communities, whether they do territorial communities or digital communities, are able to be more resilient. And this could include, like I said, territorial communities, actual physical communities, or the banking industry, for instance. So as with nodal policing, this focus on enhancing resilience builds upon and extends a long lineage of developments that have sought to be more preventative in policing. So it's not that far-fetched from the, the attempts to be preventative. And there are various cross-cutting themes within this resilience policing focus. And one of them is a, a shift in thinking, a shift in mentality 
from a social world to a social material world. And what this means is that the worlds being policed and from which policing resources are being drawn are not simply social worlds, but social, social material worlds that are made up of human and non-human actants, to borrow from Bruno Latour. So, of course, this focus on human and non-human is not, it's not a radical idea because it has been a feature of policing. Think about crime prevention through environmental design, for instance, things as, as preventing crime. But this, what makes this new is that it's taken to another level in terms of, of this type of mindset. Policing in the Anthropocene and Novocene takes non-human actants to another level. So policing professionals, police organisations, security organisations rut routinely engage things, be they ecological infrastructures or artificial intelligence, both as actors or actants creating that disorder, but also as policing assets to overcome it or to deal with, with issues of or disorder or disaster. So things or non-humans become parts of plural networks or systems of engagement. They are seen as another node or another uh, part of an assemblage. So this brings me to the other point about radical polycentricity or pluralism. This is the second kind of cross-cutting theme, is that in engaging with these new harmscapes, policing is becoming incredi incredibly and radically polycentric. And these are, are case studies that have taken place um, across the world, Australia, US, for instance, South Africa as well. So not only is network policing the order of the day, but there has been an explosion of policing agents, policing collaborations, partnerships, as well as a multiplication of policing assemblages. I mean, what Andy was saying about crisis is a great driver. So this has happened. There's been an explosion of these policing assemblages. And this has also meant a reconceptualization of the idea of security. And security has always been thought about as a singular concept, safety and security, or uh, the maintenance of order, keeping the peace. It's always been thought of as one thing that one is seeking out. But in these new assemblages, securities has been developed in terms of various securities that have to be engaged with, such as, for instance, infrastructure security, or water security, or energy security, or climate security, etc., etc. So you have these development of these assemblages radically polycentric, meaning they have multiple centres, and security has now been stretched to engage with these new issues related to these new harmscapes. And so as these developments have un unfolded, uh, established security professionals like the public police, as well as private security, depending on the context, have appeared to loosen their engagement with the criminal justice assemblages and align themselves with these other assemblages and then they play a particular role within these other assemblages. So it's not just the public police attached to a particular assemblage of criminal justice, crime, law enforcement, things like that. They've actually attached to a, a security assemblage dealing with energy or infrastructure security. And another cross-cutting theme is really this idea of resilience. There's a quest for resilience in engaging with the Anthropocene and Novocene in the face of uncertainty and catastrophe. The primary engagement now is, well, how do we develop resilience against these threats. So this has been a conceptual shift, focusing on agility and adaptability, and analysts then use these terms such as adaptive policing or resilience policing because of this quest for resilience rather than a quest, for instance, simplistically crime reduction, for instance. So then my question really is, well, what do you do with that information in terms of cap capability and skills? The starting point for us, in, if you want to engage with these homescapes, is really well, what is a vision of a 21st century policing look like in relation to these particular homescapes that we are confronted with. Um, and like I said, because there's a kind of this radical polycentrism in policing assemblages, what or where does public policing fit into these? And there's also this tension, as I mentioned earlier, around specialist and generalist policing uh, I mean, this is something the public police have to reflect on as well. Should they be all things to all people, or should they be one node in these radical plural assemblages? So what is emerging really is a reconception of public police from the idea that the police should be a comprehensive service to actually the conception that the public police can or should fill a niche role 
within these assemblages because of the nature and the shifting changes about what security or securities means. Almost done. And this also impacts on organizational arrangements. What sort of organizational arrangements need to be in place to fulfill these objectives in terms of the, the role of the public police in engaging with these new harmscapes? And finally, I actually haven't answered this question. I'm leaving it you know, back to you. What does that mean in terms of the types of skill sets that police officers on the, in the coal face of this have to engage with? And going back to the two models, the nodal policing model was very, very different types of training to a resilience policing model, to a, a, a community policing model, if you can, if you can draw on the, on the ideas of models. So that's the question. Where do we go to from here if the police or want to or should engage with these increasing disasters related to the, the two harmscapes, the Anthropocene and the Novocene. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Another fascinating presentation. So we have some time for questions again. And if we focus maybe the first couple of questions to Andy and Julie, um, and then if we've got time, we'll go back to Jennifer and Emma. That's a really that's a really good question. Um, every sector is special. Um, that's what they believe. Well, that's it, right? Um, there are there are particular opportunities within policing, but we also work with those in healthcare. Um, we work with those in in manufacturing who have had all sorts of differences around this. So I think where it's a it's a valid question to ask, but I think some of the embedded trends in there absolutely apply to police. And one for me just sitting here in this conference is the role of the supervisor appears to be undervalued and, and not, and not um, leveraged enough in the, in the learning process. It's no good what, whatever sector you're in, you put someone in college and you send them out and you don't have someone with them. So I think your point is well made, but I think there are trends going on. And I think things like technology now, um, we see in many organisational settings People are using technology quite freely at home. They come into work and they don't have the technology to use. It's a real frustration for them. So I think there's things where we've got to recognise that people are more tech enabled than we often give them credit for. So I think I'd, I'd take it carefully, but the trends are, are very much there, um, we see. And social learning again, which again is communities of practice, people working in cohorts together, those things are really powerful in frontline delivery roles, which we'd see there. So good question take the trends carefully, but they are definitely trends which we see. These are not fads yes. from, from what's going on with COVID. These are trends where organisational learning is going. Thank you. No, Thank you, Andy. Uh, Have any other questions for Andy or Julie? Yeah. Yeah, um, Yeah, and 
I'll, I'll let you answer a bit real quickly on that one. I think no longer can we say we are in policing or we are in retail. It just doesn't work like that anymore. My world is one of gaming, one of data and analytics, um, one of um, artificial reality, artificial intelligence. So as professionals, we have to be hanging around with other communities. I think hanging around with our own community only won't solve this one. So we encourage senior leaders, you've got to be hanging around with other people to see what's going on. That's time consuming, but that's the role of strategic leaders to spend some time doing that. I was fascinated by I mean, some of the challenges we've got coming up here. I mean, we need, we need experts in these fields to do it. So I think what we would encourage is don't sit in a ghetto, get out there and really understand what might be happening in adjacent communities. What are the adjacent communities that are going to affect what's going on with you? So that's how we would kind of in encourage senior leaders to do some thinking around that. But I'll let you answer some of that. One of the challenges around these assemblages, assemblages is, that, um, <laughs> is that it's not something you can just, okay, you're going to be trained to deal with this assemblage. A lot of it is on the, on the ground changing changing of thinking, changing of practices, and because it's crisis-driven, it's, it's on-the-job training at the coalface, and, and I'm thinking in this real conundrum, well, what kind of training do you provide somebody if a police officer moves from this assemblage to that assemblage to that assemblage? And sometimes it's because they want that monopoly, monopoly of use of coercive force, sometimes they want problem solving, sometimes they want something else. And so it's this adaptability, um, which is very difficult, or what does that mean in terms of what police Scotland, for instance, is. I mean, I'm not speaking to Police Scotland, but maybe that's something that can be thought about. Or, or what is it a comprehensive policing entity for some types of problems, but then a specialist for some other types of problems? And what would that mean going forward in, types, in terms of types of homescapes that Scotland is facing around you know, climate change as well as the nervous scene? Yeah. Just one quick, the last two recruitments we've done to my team, quite a big team, are two learning curators wouldn't even have a job profile for that 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. But we now recognise we have to be looking at other areas now, and these folks, we're in a museum. We, these folks are the ones who go out and find those kind of things. So I think we can't be masters of all these things, but we've certainly got our fingers in those pies, yeah. Great, thank you. So just opening up the floor again to all or any of the, the panel members, do we have any other questions? I think there was maybe somebody up here that wanted to ask um, Emma or Jennifer something earlier. to watch and wait um, with the PQF. Um, you start from the inside, um, look at your officers and staff, the talents they've got, the skills they've got, invest in them. I think some of the, some of the problems with the announcement for, from the College of the PQF is that it overlooks the existing staff, and I think that has been a real challenge. Um, and perhaps that's a really um, useful nugget of learning that we, we have in, in England and Wales. So I'd, I'd say that as an initial response. I think I'd probably um, think about what you just said, actually, in terms of there's a difference between professionalisation and being a professional. Um, and I do think that is a really important debate that we're not yet having, because I think some of the structures that have been put in place to try and make police policing professional have actually been very prescriptive, they've taken away individual discretion, 
um, they are um, not encouraging innovation um, and I think that's really important in any policing context regardless of where you are. Um, so I would agree with, with Jen, you know, that whole CPD supporting, et cetera, et cetera, but also not doing too, but making sure that you're recognising the experience and the very, very professional knowledge that officers hold themselves. Just a, a couple of sentences, literally. Um, degrees are brilliant, but they're a snapshot in time. The issue for us is continuing professional development, of which the degree is part of that. I spend most of my time at the Institute doing continuing professional development solutions, not just awarding body solutions. So I think your point, we've got to look at the ongoing thing there. It's great that we have graduates and the aspirations to do that, but there's got to be a lot more than that, and I think ongoing professional development is the key for us. I'll leave it up to professionals and, and their answers will suffice. <laughs> so we did start five minutes late, so I think on that reckoning we could, we've got time for one more question. I'm very aware that we're the only thing standing between you and lunch, but I think we can do one more question. My, the, my participants I weren't involved in that, so I, no, no, I, can't, I just can't comment, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd say I, I run a portfolio, one of the portfolios is in talent management. I have some real reservations about how we've managed that. For the record, I don't buy the nine box grid. I think <laughs> if we spend time in the bottom left hand corner, we actually fix a lot more than if we just focus on the people in the top right hand corner. So I think our view as an institute is, Everybody is talented. We've got to have solutions for everybody. Um, and I think there is some stigma that if you don't get on the program, I'm not as good as everybody else. That's why we need CPD, that everybody has a route to become better at what they do. So really happy to unpack that a bit more. But um, yeah, I, I think we've got to be very careful with the term talent management. I think it's managing the talent of everybody. Yeah, I would totally agree. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So I would just like to say a final thank you to the four panellists who have, I think, given very, very interesting and insightful presentations. And I'm sure you'll join me in thanking them. So thank you very much for coming along to our workshop. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoy lunch. <laughs> <laughs>